Okay, today we're looking at the prospering principle. And what I thought I would do is spend a few weeks talking about the uh, some of the ideas that Jesus taught that are preserved in the Gospels. And I have, uh, as you know, been approaching this from the perspective that there was the teachings of Jesus and then the teachings about Jesus. And I was thinking yesterday, as I was preparing some of these thoughts, what would it have been about the man Jesus that made him stand out? Uh, if most of what we know about him through the Gospels is the product of the Gospel writers themselves, and I think basically what they did is put in writing the uh, ideas that were being passed on by word of mouth, how Jesus and his meaning, his life, his meaning was being interpreted. That uh, the Gospel of Mark represents a consolidation of that view because that view passed on by word of mouth would have been drifting all the time. There would be nothing solid. There would be a co uh, some core ideas but until it was put in writing, it was not yet solidified, so it would drift. But I have thought often about what was it that made Jesus stand out? Because there were a number of healers back in his day that we know of. We know of one in particular, uh, Polyneus, uh, was considered a, a rival of Jesus. He was able to uh, raise people from the dead and heal sick folks and it was a person that traveled all over the world in fact went clear to India and uh, it was a pretty interesting character a Polyneus of uh, Tyana look him up on the internet and you'll find quite a bit about him but he uh, did not make the grade, you know, in terms of the Christian community or the followers of Jesus. The Jesus made a special impression somehow on the community of people around him. And this whole idea that he was the expected Messiah, I do not believe he entertained that idea. I think he would have considered that counterproductive because there had been so many people that did that. They stood up and uh, proclaimed themselves as the Jews expected Messiah. And most of them were made fools of. They were disgraced. They would drum up a bit of a following for a while and they would prove to be fraudulent. Since the time of Jesus, there have been more than 40 people that have stood up and said that they are Jesus' return. There are several alive now. There's a couple over in Australia that are that have quite a following that are claiming to be a reincarnation of Jesus. But this happens all the time. And, you know, when we, you know, that Reverend Moon and there's, well, there's been a number. Jim Jones was supposed to be some kind of Messiah. And there have been a number of them. David Karish, Koresh, uh, a number of people that have stood up and done that. And... Usually when they do that, most of us kind of look at that with a great deal of skepticism. And um, I think Jesus was pretty familiar with that dynamic. People standing up saying, I'm the one, you know, I've come back. I'm the one that's going to lead you. They were all looking for a following, and they were looking for a following that could support them in a full-time ministry. Jesus had that. But his following, according to, I think it's Luke, uh, the people that supported him did not support him because they believed he was the Messiah. They supported him because he was a healer. And uh, there were three women's names that are mentioned as uh, providing out of their means, and then it says in many others. But the three that financially supported him. One was Mary Magdalene and said that 
He cast seven demons out of her. It was a healing. Call the demons whatever you want. But they didn't support or follow him because he was considered the Messiah. But more because he was a healer. And I think that's a pretty interesting thing to look at. And, you know, if we just accept everything at face value, we're not going to ask these kinds of questions. We're not going to explore these kinds of ideas. But I have to keep coming back. Who was Jesus? What, what did he teach that was so appealing to, I think, the common person? And I think there are several things that we can see. First of all, he didn't teach people like a, a scribe or a Pharisee or a rabbi, typical rabbi, who probably quoted as uh, our evangelists do today, a thousand scriptures for every word they say. He spoke from the heart. He spoke from a level of authority that uh, told people he was having some kind of experience. He knew what he was talking about. He was a mystic. He was a person who was aware of his oneness with God. And I think that uh, because he called God Father, that was one of the things that got him in trouble with the Romans. Because if he called God Father, that means he's the Son of God, and Caesar was the Son of God, not Jesus, not a Jewish peasant. And so it wouldn't be too difficult to come up with a crime with whether he said that about himself or they, it was being said of him. The uh, Roman antenna would have gone up, you know, the radar. He would have been on the radar very early. But we understand what he was talking about, that he was speaking of God as an indwelling source, the source of life and power, the source of his being. And he called it Father, I think, out of respect, not disrespect to Rome's emperor, but out of respect for his own father, his own family ties. But, you know, that's all speculation. We can speculate till we're blue in the face, and that's what a lot of uh, scholarship is about, is speculation. You'll read often in uh, scholarly write-ups, many scholars believe that means speculation. Many scholars believe, doesn't say many scholars know for sure, know for abs as an absolute fact. There just aren't that many facts about Jesus that we absolutely know. So it's, a, it's an interesting question, what would make him stand out? And I do think he made significant waves in the community that he served. I think he knew how to do it. I think he was, uh, again, a healer. And people were interested in healing as we are today. I was reading more about the uh, fountain of uh, Lourdes, you know, Lourdes, France, where people go to the, bathe in this pool and they drink the water and experience healings. And that water has been examined and it has been proven that it's ordinary water. There's nothing extraordinary about the water at all, chemically speaking. So many are saying that it's a placebo effect, that people experience a healing out of a placebo effect. When we look at the life of Jesus as a healer, it says he couldn't do many great works in his own hometown because people knew him. This is the son of the carpenter. We know his brothers and his sisters. So Jesus couldn't do many great works, it says, in his own town. Is that the placebo effect? It may well be. Because he would come in. Actually, the story of him sending his disciples out, sending out the 70 before him to preach the good news. What I see that as possibly being is he sends people out he sends his disciples out to see if this town is receptive to the healer, to this person as a healer. And if they're not, you know, he says, kick the dust from your sandals and go on. We won't go to that town. But if you go there and find them receptive, let's go there. 
So I think there was a lot of that dynamic involved that a person's, and Jesus said several times, your faith has made you whole. He never said, you're welcome that I healed you. It was always your faith has made you whole. And so we kind of skim over some of this stuff. But he had, what I believe he did is spoke with such authority. And his disciples went out before him to prepare the way to prepare people for his visit. The expectations were high. And so he was able to be successful as a healer, except in his own country. If a person has, a, has the power to heal, I would kind of equate that to a cattle prod. If I, if I had a cattle prod and touched you with it, you know, you would know it. And I could touch someone that says, I don't believe that cattle prod will shock me. <laughs> I have no faith. And I could touch that person with it. And sure enough, they'd be shocked. So the cattle prod is a source of power. And it's universal. It'll shock anybody <laughs> and everybody. But if I'm a healer, does that mean I have that kind of power? If we think of healing in that regard, or think of a healer in that regard, we would think whoever you would touch, you could heal because you've got the power, just like the cattle prod. Whoever it touches is going to shock. But that doesn't appear to be the case with healing. There has to be a belief. And isn't that true with modern medicine? Don't we have to have some level of faith that it's going to help us? for it to help. I think there's kind of a gray area there. I don't know the answer to that that question, but I think that one who believes it will help will probably be helped more than one who doesn't. But anyway, let's get into this lesson here. He talks about the kingdom of God, and this is really an important uh, subject in the New Testament because it's a it's a prominent idea, the kingdom of God. What is this? He says, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. He's talking about a process that occurs whether we think about it or not. And he says, this is how the kingdom of God works. So when you think about the kingdom of God from the literal perspective, from the mainstream Christian perspective, the kingdom of God is a thing that's going to come. It's going to be established. It's going to, there's a lot of, a lot of things that are going to happen. Uh, all of the negative evil people will be destroyed or something's going to happen there and the good ones will be gathered together and you know the whatever story you heard have grown up with uh, that's kind of hard to reconcile with this parable because he's talking about a seed and a process in that seed combined with the soil that we have nothing to do with it's a natural energetic expression and from a mystical point of view, that makes perfect sense. That there is an energy flowing through all of us all the time. And we can learn to tap into that. We say, let go and let God. It's like when you plant the seed, you let go and let God. You don't try to make the seed grow. He's speaking of a process that is occurring all the time. Not something we make happen. I believe that we can interfere with it. And that's one of the problems. And the need, that's why there's a need for a teacher. Someone to teach people how not to interfere with it in a negative way. How to cooperate with it in a positive way. And I think this is the reason Jesus was so popular. He could take things out of the religious realm 
the traditional religion realm of uh, that he was uh, raised in and he could tell people spiritual things that they could relate to and he would say things like this it's something very common everybody knows what it's like to plant a seed and watch it grow and you know that you don't have anything to do with its growth there's a process there he's saying there's a process the kingdom of God is like this it's a process it's not difficult to see that a central New Testament theme involves the kingdom of God as to the nature of this so-called kingdom however we find conflicting views consistent with the principles of oneness it is on the one hand presented as a subjective spiritual process that's how Jesus presents it on the other hand consistent with the mainstream narrative the kingdom is presented as an objective coming event you know turn on any evangelical message and you'll see that uh, they're all reading the tea leaves the signs of the time saying this and this is this is happening because the kingdom is coming you know it's at hand it's going to happen soon I uh, saw one yesterday that was pretty interesting the uh, minister if his face got any more red I think his jugglers were going to explode but uh, you know the, that type of message has always been around and that's why I think in the Gospels instead of predicting when it was going to happen as Paul did because it never happened in Paul's life they said no one not even the Son of Man knows when it's going to happen so here, here we are 2,000 some years later and it still has not happened. I have no doubt in my mind that it's not going to happen as predicted, as projected, as thought in mainstream Christianity. It's an inner awakening. It is an inner process that is the same kind of thing that is involved in a seed. There's an energy that is flowing through us, every one of us. And we have to learn to tap into it. The seed growing silently portrays the relationship between an individual's consciousness and the way their life unfolds. The type seed sown determines what sprouts and grows. How it, grows, how, how it sprouts and grows is a mystery. It is sufficient to know that it happens. And an illustration I've used before that I really like is there is a natural flow illustrated throughout nature human imagination introduces color into this flow the natural world does not introduce color and by this I mean you think of a stream and it's emptying into a pond and human consciousness is a person taking a color of dye a red dye for instance and dumping it in that spring in that stream and Pretty soon the pond turns red. If we dump blue in that stream, the pond turns blue. And that's the relationship we have with this flow. Nature, the natural world, does not have that ability, doesn't have the imagination that creates the dye, that creates the different colors. And the different colors are things like fear or uh, the desire to dominate or the uh, any negative human trait that you can think of is not found in nature it doesn't come naturally it's a product of human imagination and often it comes as a result of abuse or it comes there's all kinds of reasons where why it would develop why would we would imagine ourselves imagine life as something other but Jesus talked about the lilies of the field and the birds of the air. <clears throat> they don't toil and spin. They don't make their own clothing. They don't work in that regard. But they are clothed. He's not saying they don't work because if you look at any birds, I think we had three this morning hit the window because they're busy. They're not watching what they're doing. And they're flying around, you know, seeing a reflection, I guess, in the window and... Uh, Hopefully they learn something from that. Uh, sometimes we do and sometimes we don't. But um, 
he's not saying they're inactive. He's not saying they don't do things to provide for themselves because they do. But he's saying they know how to do it in a natural way. Whereas human beings can come up with all kinds of things. We come up with the belief, for example, that we're a victim of something. And so we victimize ourselves or we see ourselves as victims and see ourselves as something less than everyone else or we're entitled to this or that. We hear this all the time these days and uh, it's something we've got to get over. It's a disease that we have to rise above. We have to understand uh, the teachings of someone like Jesus. That nature doesn't have the ability to imagine uh, to, to start dumping red food coloring, a red uh, dye into the stream and changing the color of our life. So he's saying that think about the natural world and see yourself in that light. See yourself in the same way. That there is a process working through you and he's calling it the kingdom of God. Very different than thinking of kingdom of God as something that's going to be established. Uh, and generally, a lot of them thought of it as a military thing. But it was not that or a political thing. It was not either one of those things. It's a process, a way of thinking. And the idea of the seed, you know, depends on what kind of seed you throw out. Depend, it will determine what, what kind of a crop you get. And so people of all ages have tried to help people connect the way they think, the way they see themselves with the way their life unfolds. And I think Jesus had uh, a real talent for this and people really did respond to it in a, in a very positive way. That they responded to that, not the belief that someday he was going, going, to, he was going to die and then someday return. That's a whole different mindset. It's a whole different way of thinking. That's the victim mentality. Uh, my life is being overrun. Someday somebody's going to come and save me. And, um, you know, that's kind of where we are today. We need God to return to save the world from its problems. I think the world will keep turning. Uh, things will probably change along the way as they always have. Some of us will survive that. Some of us will not. But the world will keep turning and we'll probably be back for another phase of it somehow I don't know how all that works but there is a process going on in us now that we want to acknowledge the kingdom of God is at hand it's not four months and the and the uh, the harvest comes it's happening now lift up your eyes see the fields are ready for harvest now it's a process. It's happening in us at this very moment. So right now, the way we see ourselves, the way we think of our life and so forth is, in a sense, a dye that we're putting in the stream of consciousness, in the stream of how we think, how we behave, how we uh, approach life on a daily basis, how we see ourselves. We're pouring something in there that's creating a certain color, and that color is what our life is. It's how our life shows up. Who's responsible for that? Is it happening to me, or is it happening through me? If it's happening to me, I will look for a Savior. I hope the kingdom of God is a literal thing, that my Savior will come back and fix the problems in my life. But if it's happening through me, that means... I've got some decisions to make now. How do I see myself? What am I saying about my life every day? Is my life a friend or is it someone I'm saying, uh, I like you, but not that much. I'd like to change you. You know, what are we saying to ourselves? What are we saying to our life? Because it's this process that we're involved in that we don't start or stop. It's always happening. It's that energy flowing through the seed that's causing the change to occur. And the manifestation of that is our life as a whole, the quality of our life as a whole. The parable is something a mystic like Jesus would use. 
We're told that his main audience was comprised of the common people, most struggling with poverty, and that's true. The majority of people that uh, lived Jesus' time were poor. And there was a ruling class, but the majority were poor. The good news that he brought is that you can alter your life's conditions by changing the focus of your belief system. Consider how the wild lilies grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. Very powerful message. So we're talking about building a consciousness. How do we know when we have a prosperity consciousness? I've been asked that question a lot, and it's uh, the best way I think I know how to explain it is if you drove here this morning, you have a driving consciousness. You have a consciousness for driving a car. Do you remember the first time you drove your car? You remember how awkward that might have felt? I was uh, My first car that I drove was my dad's Buick Electra. And it's like sailing a cruise ship. It's a huge vehicle. And I did not have a consciousness for doing that. It was like a foreign thing to sit in this huge boat at 16 years old and drive it. And um, I used to volunteer after I got my license. And I got it the day of my birthday. My grandfather took me to, to get it. But we used to get eight gallons of milk from a dairy farm that was, uh, I don't know how many miles away, but it was out in the country. And we would get eight gallons a week. Our family of six would go through that much. And it was the kind of milk that had the cream on it, you know, and all the good stuff. But I volunteered to do that job because I wanted to drive. And I, my first time out, it was raining. I'm in this humongous Buick Electra. And I was going around a corner blacktop curve thinking, I wonder what it, this thing would do if I put the accelerator all the way down to the floor. <laughs> and what I discovered is it does this. It, fish, it goes in circles. And I mean, the wheels just broke loose and everything went crazy. Well, I went sideways into a ditch and slid for a long way. Fortunately, it was so muddy it did not hurt the car. But <clears throat> My father showed up because a farmer called him. Everybody knows everybody in a small town. And the farmer called him because he had his tractor out to pull the car out. My father comes out. I said, I don't really know what happened. You know, I was just driving along, <laughs> minding my own business, and this thing went in the ditch. Well, he looked at the marks and everything that happened. He told me exactly what I did, and I was grounded from driving. So. I did not have a consciousness for driving at that time, but I added just a little bit more information, you know, to that consciousness as a result of knowing what would happen when you floor a Buick Electra. So when you have a consciousness for something, you do it without thinking about it. It becomes such a part of you that you can do it without thinking about it. And it's not that you don't have situational awareness, because I hope when all of you drove here this morning, you had some situational awareness. <laughs> I think some people do not have that as they're driving. But <clears throat> when you can get into your car and you think more about where you're going than how you're going to get there, you have a consciousness as a driver. And <clears throat> if you are born in poverty, as many of Jesus' followers were, and you're struggling every day, and you've watched your parents do it, and their parents. And this is part of your consciousness. This is, you get up every day thinking from that perspective. You've got a consciousness, not of prosperity, but of poverty. And so this guy comes along and says, you know, you can change the way you think about life. It doesn't mean you're going to be a millionaire. It doesn't mean you're going to be, uh, you know, your life is going to change dramatically in the sense that you're going to be crowned king someplace or be uh, the, so you can lord over your um, everybody else. But if you begin changing the way you think about your life, the way you think about yourself, the way you describe 
your life. Instead of talking about how difficult life is, talk about opportunities, the good things that are unfolding and put a, a more of a positive attitude toward that. It would take anybody time to make that kind of change. Somebody was asking me a couple of weeks ago about the homeless issue, what I thought would solve it. And I don't know what would solve it. What I do know is that if you maintain a lifestyle that produces a life you don't like, the first thing that's got to change is you. The first thing that's got to change is your thinking, the way you think about yourself, the way you think about your life. And if you have someone that's not willing to look at that or do that, a message like this is not going to help at all. But I think probably in Jesus' day, there were enough people that could hear what he was saying that caught on to that, that thought, well, that makes sense. Maybe that will help. Maybe that will make my life better somehow. And that would be a pretty dramatic way of thinking because what if you're born a slave and you think, you know, you've been taught all your life, you're born that, so you're always going to be that. What if you started thinking to yourself, maybe I don't have to be that. Or maybe I can rise above that level of experience that to me would be the good news Jesus brought not someday I'm going to be killed and 2,000 some years later and counting I'm going to come back and fix your problems <laughs> to me that's not good news that's bad news good news is something that is passed on that can help me change my life now that can help me improve the quality of my experience now that's why I think he was popular. And I think that something grew up around him, and it was probably the timing and all of that, that he was a, uh, a pretty profound teacher. He got people's attention. But also, this brewing problem between the Romans and Jews was happening, and they needed a Messiah. And so that probably developed as a result of that, like the perfect storm kind of thing coming together all at once. People had made the connection between a person's actions and their life's condition, but only in a negative way. Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? They understood the connection between consciousness and life, the life experience, but in a negative way. They never equated someone that was wealthy. Why did this man become wealthy? Uh, what did he do so right? You know, it was always a negative thing. So Jesus presented the positive counterpoint to this idea. If you focus on the good, the good will manifest. If you ask for a fish, you will not get a serpent. If you ask for bread, you will not get a stone. I think it was that type of talk, that type of thinking, that people responded. Maybe I can have a better life. Maybe I don't have to resign to live in a life of squalor. A life of poverty. So the mainstream version of the kingdom of God is an, ambi an ambiguous future event. Seeing God as a present reality gives us the ability to align with the natural prospering principle that opens our life in beautiful ways. So this is the Jesus that I am coming to know better all the time. That he was a profound teacher. And if I was living in that day under the circumstances that we uh, can find, historians will describe for us. We don't know much about Jesus himself, but we know a lot about the conditions that he grew up in. That that type of message would be good news to people, you can change the experience you have with your life. Thank you for watching this week's program. If you enjoyed this video, please share it with others. We want to reach as many people as we can, and we appreciate your help. If you'd like to help support this ministry, just click the donate card at the top right hand corner of your screen. Your financial support means a lot to us. We have many subjects in our video lineup, 
so feel free to take a look. If there's a topic you don't see and would like me to address, just put it in the comment section. I'd love to know what's on your mind. To subscribe to this channel, simply click our logo. Thanks again for your interest in Independent Unity, and have a wonderful week.